And we're live. Back at you live and direct with another Ideas Matter podcast. This is Alex. This is Louis. We're here today with The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Yeah, Rousseau. Uh, we've been foreshadowing this one for a while. And we said we were going to read it because a listener requested Rousseau. Um, and look, I, I didn't hate it. Mm. I didn't love it. Um, I've said to you a few times and I stand by this that I think it's the simultaneously the best and the worst of liberalism. Mm. Um, although calling him a liberal is probably anachronistic, but even if he himself is not a liberal, it's undeniable that Rousseau has influenced liberalism. So I think in that respect, like his thoughts represent simultaneously the best and the worst that that tradition has to offer and I'll explain what I mean by that later um but yeah what what were your what were your general thoughts on on the social contract uh mixed to say the least yeah it starts out where you you sort of like deriving first principles for like political life and political organization and it all feels incredibly rigid Mm -hmm. uh to the point where it at least how I read it, it seems that what he's talking about in terms of like what an ideal political community looks like is something so small that it can only work in like rural Swiss mountain villages, which is kind of where he got his ideas from. Yeah. (laughs) Like being around rural Switzerland. But later on, he starts to like flesh it out and add a bit of subtlety and a bit of a, bit of nuance to what he's talking about. So I think it actually got better as it went on, but it's still a really weird mix of complete rigidity and nuance that, I don't know, yeah, it just didn't strike me as being all that fulfilling as like a unified philosophical text. He's not a good writer. I thought he's a clear writer in the sense that like you can read what he says in any given paragraph and know what he's talking about but then he'll like yeah he's a bad writer in a in the sense of like something an argument across a book Mm. because he'll just 100 pages later clarify something he said before that isn't actually immediately relevant to what he's talking about at this point yeah like he really needs an editor yeah yeah, Rousseau definitely did um, need an editor. Unless you're like super interested in like democratic theory or political theory, I wouldn't recommend picking this one up yourself and reading it. Mm. Um, but that being said, it was like hugely interesting. Um, so as you mentioned, like he was Swiss. He was born in Switzerland, Geneva. I'm just reading like the first page of this book now. Um, and the social contract was published in 1762. And the social contract is a, a tradition in... Western political philosophy. Um, Usually the big three that you associate with it are Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Um, But this one is explicitly titled The Social Contract. And just for those of you not familiar with it, the idea of the social contract, it's really a sort of a device, a philosophical rhetorical device used to justify uh, contemporary states and governments and societies, um, what, um, uh, which sort of sounds odd. Like, why? Why would you need to do that? And and I think his like the history here is 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 important because historically in Europe, you know, you had like the divine right of kings. It was sort of taken for granted that like social systems were legitimated by God, right? But through the influence of the Enlightenment. And thinkers such as Hobbes, who start to give you like mechanistic political philosophies, they try they can explain things without reference to God. Um, there's a famous like mathematician in France writing during the Enlightenment who's explaining one of his theories to um, the French king, and the king asked, "Where does God fit into this theory of yours?" And he replied, "I have no need to posit him." Um, so you get you start to get these explanations that make sense without the need deposit God and Hobbes begins by doing a very similar thing in Leviathan where he constructs a theory of like state and society and what legitimates 
governments and government power and the taking away of freedoms from people. And he does this without appealing to the divine right of kings. He, he does it in a sort of mechanistic, natural way. And Locke and Rousseau are in that tradition. They're explaining and they're justif- justifying contemporary societies which have both rights but also burdens on their citizens. And, and they're justifying that in quote unquote like a secular way, I guess. So historically, that's why you get the so- like social contract theories. And in a nutshell, basically what they are is they sort of say, well, before societies existed, um, humans lived in a state of nature, uh, which is either you know highly individualistic as per Hobbes and Locke, or slightly more social and communal as per Rousseau. But basically, humans lived in a state of nature. There, there were no governments, um, and then we band together and we form societies and we basically like have a social contract which forms the underlying basis for our societies. Now, Hobbes thought we did this purely for utility because the state of nature was a war of all against all. Uh, Locke thought we did it um, because we needed societies to like enforce property rights and to recognise natural law, but he wasn't as pessimistic and violent in his thoughts about the state of nature as Hobbes. And Rousseau, similarly, like he says explicitly at some point in the book, that there comes a point where our ability to survive in the state of nature just takes too much effort and we're going to perish unless we band together. So we band together to survive, um, but it's it's often a sort of a sort of spark notes, unsophisticated reading of Rousseau because we all know that Rousseau critiqued Hobbes. Hobbes thought we were very violent and selfish and greedy. Famous quote, life is nasty, perdition short. Um, and he says, well, that's what humans naturally are and we see it sort of unencumbered in the state of nature. Rousseau's retort to that is quite famous. He goes, no, 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 that's what humans are like in society. It's society that corrupts us and makes us greedy and selfish. And you've projected that back in time when actually, no, in the state of nature, we, we may have been much more empathetic. We have these sort of natural sentiments for one another. And, and so a sort of crude reading of Rousseau as he thinks like humans in state of nature, good, society, bad. And that's not the case. And, and you get that from reading this. It's much more nuanced than that. Society for Rousseau plays a dual function. On the one hand, it, it, it makes us smarter, more sophisticated. It enables culture. These, it enables human flourishing. He says we have a crude form of freedom in the state of nature, but in civilised society we have a much more sophisticated form of freedom, which is more preferable. But it's a double-edged sword because bad societies can morally corrupt us, can make us selfish. So it's not one or the other. You can get this wrong and society can corrupt you, but if you get it right, then it can lead to more human flourishing. So I just want to get that sort of misinterpretation of Rousseau out of the way quite quickly. Um, and that's that's why you have these sort of social contract theorists. That's their that's their mission, so to speak. Mm. So yeah, they're they're trying to get to the bare bones of how society is constituted, and by going to those first principles, elaborate from there what an ideal society looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to elaborate what an ideal society looks like, um, which is a little bit platonic in a sense, and like sort of sitting around thinking about, well, what, what's the best republic? What's the best system of government? How do we get there? It's like one of those YouTube videos where it's like top 10 political systems ranked. <laughs> yeah. Top 10 most powerful anime characters. Yeah. You wonder like which ancient philosophers today would be, would have YouTube channels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know about Rousseau. <laughs> yeah. I think Nietzsche would. No, Nietzsche would have a podcast. I think Nietzsche would have a podcast. Yeah, I think so. He'd be he'd be a shock jock. Yeah, Nietzsche would be a shock jock. Anyways. I think Rousseau would just post on like anime forums. Yeah. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get that vibe. Just an anime poster. I occasionally go on 4chan. I don't know. Uh, this, this is unrelated to the social contract, but bi- fun biographical bit about Rousseau is that he's he's incredibly influential in philosophy of education. Yeah. He, he, he's one of like the great philosophical theorists of education, what what the goals and the ends of education ought to be and how you get there. Um, yeah, he's very influential today, actually. His, his descendants, like John Dewey, and from John Dewey, like Paolo Freire, and th- it's just 
completely his DNA is completely through modern educational thought. But uh, yeah, he, interesting. He writes this book about the ideal way to you know raise a child and educate them so they become like a like a free, educated, rational individual and capable of moving through the world and handling themselves. But in his private life, he had like five kids with a servant girl and then like put them all into an orphanage. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, pretty cooked. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. That's the social contract. <laughs> That's the social contract. <laughs> No, but that, do, do you think that the reason why he's writing about the philosophy of education is because, as I was sort of saying before, he sees human nature as much more malleable than some of these other thinkers? Like, he, he, he acknowledges a much greater role for society to be able to either completely stuff you up or to actually help humans reach their fullest potential. Yeah, yeah. I Look, I can't speak too confidently about uh, his educational thought because... I, I haven't read it myself and like we've been discovering more and more the the sort of uh, popular idea you get about a work of philosophy uh, can end up being quite a lot different from what that work of philosophy actually looks like. Yeah. But like the Sparknotes version of uh, his educational work, which is called Emile, is that um, children and students ought to be raised in such a way that they're free to explore their own passions and interests independently without having them be imposed. And if you let them have autonomy in the things that they want to investigate and learn about, then they're going to reach the, the greatest fruition of their intellectual life through pursuing that because they won't see it as something that's imposed on them that they, like, they're forced to do and thus lose enjoyment. On. But... Uh, I haven't read it myself, so I can't actually speak with confidence. I, I ordered a copy. It should be coming within the next few days, actually. So mm. I'll give a little book report. That's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, you were saying before that, like, they're trying to work out the best system of government, and they are. But I also think another point to add to that is they're also, like, they're, they're trying to justify systems of government which already exist. Mm. So that sort of inflects their thought quite a lot. Um, yeah, they're trying to get down to the brass tacks about legitimacy too. Yeah, it's really about legitimacy and like what legitimates A, governments, but B, government power and like the ability of a government to... What is the limit of government power? And to what extent can they trample on our rights and liberties and how much can they ask us to do? And Rousseau is a very interesting thinker because he breaks with... Oh, like Locke, for example, or Mill, in allowing much more scope for government intervention and for the government to force us to do things. Mm. He even talks about one point at forcing people to be free, which is quite an interesting idea. And so there's this sort of debate, which, look, I'm, I've just read a book, <laughs> What is Intellectual History? And I've been reading Quinton Skinner's famous essay, um, meaning and understanding in the history of ideas. So this is like how to read historical texts. And they really caution against these sort of like reading texts from today's perspective and being like, oh, this thinker is like a proto-liberal or a proto-utilitarian or they anticipated this later thinker or here we find the first, first you know, interpretations of this later idea. They go, well, that's, that's nonsensical. You can't impose these ideas back on this thinker because they themselves couldn't have possibly meant that because those terms weren't available to them. So that's kind of forced me to change how I read these texts. But that being said, there is this big debate about Rousseau and, and is Rousseau the founder in some ways of totalitarianism? Like the ideas that he sets forth in this book, do they legitimate totalitarianism or are they about pure democracy? And there's that sort of competing interpretation about what's going on in Rousseau. Yeah, and as with a lot of dichotomous readings of things, the I feel like this is a corny thing to say, but I feel like the truth of the matter is somewhere in the middle, at least of how I read it. Or both. Yeah, I don't think you can call him a wholly authoritarian thinker, but you couldn't call him wholly democratic either. 
Yeah, and I guess another point to caution there is like we should be wary of like thinking about democracy, what we mean by it, by projecting our modern vision of democracy back in time and reading Rousseau and then judging him to that standard by, by, by basically judging him to what extent he approximates our idea of democracy. Like that's, at that point, you're not really reading Rousseau. You're just using him as a crutch to like further develop your own ideas that you already had. Um, but yeah, I think, I think both can be true at the same time and contradictory things can be true at the same time. You can find like, these are flawed individuals. And this was another fallacy that I, that I got out of these, like the methodological readings I've been doing. Um, there's this fallacy in intellectual history called the mythology of coherence. And we assume when we read these texts by these famous people that their ideas should be coherent. And so when we find contradictions, we just bend over backwards trying to reconcile them rather than just making the much more simple and probably realistic assumption that these are flawed humans who produce highly infallible works and perhaps the work is just contradictory. Perhaps the author had some cognitive dissonance going on. Like we, we need to get over this idea of like trying to find coherence in all these ideas. Yeah, that's why I love Nietzsche so much because he's just completely unconcerned about contradicting himself. Yeah. Like uh, in the preface to um on the genealogy of morals he talks about this book that one of his uh colleagues wrote and he's like when i read that book i loved it because i knew how wrong it was and then i'm i'm just finishing up one of his earlier books called human or to human which is written around the same time he read that book in question and, and at the start of human or to human he's like I read the most fantastic book. It's so good. I agree with everything about it. <laughs> Just a couple of years later, I knew how bullshit it was as soon as I read it. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know about that one, mate. <laughs> uh, I want to read. I want to read the first line of chapter one in book one. Rousseau says, "Man was born free, and he is everywhere in chains." Great way to open a book. Very punchy. Very punchy. Those who think themselves the masters of others are indeed greater than sl are indeed greater slaves than they. How did this transformation come about? I do not know. How can it be made legitimate? That question I believe I can answer. And he goes on later to say that the fundamental question that he's trying to address with this book is how to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force of all and under which each individual while uniting himself with the others, Im obeys no one but himself and remains as free as before. This is the fundamental problem to which the social contract holds the solution. So in a nutshell, how can we hold on to as much of our natural freedom as possible when we enter a society, but also get the benefits from the society? How can we have our cake and eat it too? And he thinks the way that we can answer this question is through this idea of the social contract. And... Look, his reasoning here is is a little bit, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to say I totally disagree, I totally agree. It's just kind of bizarre. He says that, like, what well, what really happens is, like, when we enter this society, um, no one gains, what, what, what anyone gains over me, I gain as much over them. So, the, so they sort of cancel each other out. So, right, like, my my loss of freedom to like walk down the street and just rob someone. Okay. I've lost that freedom, but I've also gained the freedom for that not to happen to me. So the end result is that I m maintain the same level of freedom, but I'm also a lot safer. So he thinks that like this system of rights in the social contract, we don't end up losing any more freedom, which is an interesting way of wiggling out of the problem. I thought, yeah, yeah, it was very interesting. He says that like the basis of the social contract is that everybody completely submits to it. Yeah. So you completely give up your freedom in a in a sort of natural sense. Uh and but through doing that and through entering this social contract, this like political association with everybody else who agrees to do the same thing, you end up gaining more freedom than you would have done before because everybody else has taken the same deal of relinquishing their freedom. 
Mm. So you, you're all pulled together in a collective sense and thus able to get more room for manoeuvre than you could otherwise. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. I remember years ago watching um, an episode of Q&A before Q&A went to shit, which is sort of like political talk show here in Australia. And they had this American guy on and, you know, Australia, they sort of, these Aussies were asking these like really naive questions about American politics. Like, well, why is it so polarised? Like, what's going on in the United States? Kind of, And this American author made a quite an interesting observation where he he said that um, in many respects, democracy is the ability to lose to someone else and not view them as the enemy. Um, and what's happening, he thought, in the United States was like increasingly people were losing faith in the legitimacy of the system. So if you lose an election, you no longer think, oh, well, I lost an election, that's fine. Increasingly, like, the stakes are being raised. And what Rousseau is talking about here is when we enter a society, we bind ourselves completely to it. And so it might be the case that, like, this society will do certain things that we don't agree with, but we have decided to subordinate ourselves completely to it. And even if a law is passed or a government is elected that we don't agree with, we still, we still follow them. We, st- we, we still go along with it um, because, and this is where it gets highly controversial, Rousseau posits this idea of the general will, right? And so the general will is the complete and pure expression of, like, democratic sovereignty. A people acting collectively and expressing their will is the general will, Um and so obviously in a purely ideal sense, the general will would be expressed unanimously. Like you'd get everyone together voting and everyone would vote the same way. Now, obviously he acknowledges like this is not possible, nor could it be possible. Um, but he still holds on to this idea that like a I, pure idea of the general will, a collective agreement on what the common good is, is possible. Um, and we get it through people coming together and deliberating and voting on things. And so he has this interesting discussion where he's like, well, when you meet in an assembly and you vote on something, um, you have to vote not according to your particular interest. You have to put that aside and you have to vote for what you think the common good is. And if it happens that in that vote, you end up in the minority, what you should then take from that is not oh, well, I didn't win this time. I still think I'm right. They're wrong. You're supposed to think, oh, I'm wrong. I was mistaken about what the common good is because the majority, when they're thinking clearly, which is obviously like a big caveat, um, will always express, will always express the general will. It's kind of like when politicians say, oh, the people always get it right, like about elections. (laughs) Yeah, and that's where that, That kind of like retroactively explains that very kind of creepy sounding quote where he says uh, people who want to go against the general will have to be forced to be free. Yeah. Because, you know, taking the general will and the social contract in the way that he explains it, which is that you gain more freedom through it by relinquishing your natural freedom. But if you want to go against the general will then you're sort of abrogating the contract, right? You're yeah. breaking that contract. And thus, by doing that, you are losing on the, out on the freedom that you gain through that contract. So for your own good, you have to be forced to be free by being a part, by remaining a part yeah. of that contract. For your own good. I think yeah. you could probably reframe it by saying you can be forced to be rational. Mm. Um, when you act irrationally in a society, when you go against this contract, or when you go against the general will because you think that your particular will diverges from it, you can be forced to, yeah, basically go along. Um, and in doing so, you're being, A, forced to be free, but forced to be more rational. I, th- I think a way of making sense of this concept of general will is, is through the idea of positive freedom. Now, like that might be a little bit anachronistic again because that was a, t- a term coined by Isaiah Berlin writing in the 20th century. But he delineates these like two versions of freedom. Um, and I think I talk about this in the podcast on like Confucianism and liberalism. It's worth going over again. Yeah, the various forms of freedom. So like a crude negative freedom is like you're free to do whatever you want. Freedom is non-interference. And then the positive liberty theorists come along and they go, well, 
yeah, but like people can be mistaken about what's actually good for them. And is it really freedom if like you're just allowed to just keep falling over and making mistakes? If you're, a, I don't know, a, a gambling addict and society just goes, yeah, we have no gambling regulations. You're free to do whatever you want. And you just waste your life away. Like, is that really freedom? Um, so the positive freedom theorists go, well, you have to have the capacity to be free. And also being free is doing what's rational. So they sort of create this divergence in the self and there's the self that acts on the short term, on the instincts, on the impulses. And then there's the self that thinks long term and it thinks rationally. And they say, well, if you were to choose, you would identify with your rational self. You would say, when I'm being most rational, when I'm making rational decisions about my life, that is most congruent with my, with my sense of self, with my identity. I identify with the version of me that like goes to sleep before midnight, right? <laughs> That's when I'm like, okay, you're, you're in tune with who you are there and you're, you're, you're acting in your long-term interests. And so they use this idea to do things in the name of freedom, which Asaya Berlin thinks can easily slide into tyranny, but Rousseau and other thinkers see as being perfectly compatible with freedom, i.e. you can force someone to be more rational. You can force someone to be free. I, I guess a, a contemporary example of this would be vaccine mandates, something like that, like forcing someone to do the rational thing. Um, it's often like the way that this debate is played out, I find like really crude and simplistic because it's like freedom on the one hand, freedom on, or, you know, not freedom on the other side, where really like both sides just have different ideas about what it means to be free. One is a very like individualistic non-interference freedom. The other is like, no, we're all interconnected and you're not really free if you're being misled by misinformation. You have to act rationally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's possible to read Rousseau as this, yeah, um, very much in the positive freedom side of things where he's like, if you diverge from the general will, if you act irrationally, society can force you to be free. And that, that's, not an, that's not an incoherent concept to him. Right. And it's, it's easy to see why this gets seen, gets viewed uh, as a sort of inheritance in authoritarian societies, though. Like this, being mindful of, you know, not reading this back into Rousseau, but he ended up being incredibly influential on the French revolutionaries and especially Robespierre. Yeah. Who ended up being a very powerful and bloody leader of France uh, during the bloodiest period of the revolution, um, headed this committee of public safety, which ended up be being some sort of bloody authoritarian ideological control group. He maintained Robespierre that he was just a Rousseauist through and through, like to the bone. He's... He just loves Rousseau. He thinks he's the most brilliant political thinker ever and he's just implementing his ideas. So there's parts of this where y if you take certain things of his, it kind of goes awry. But he adds a lot of nuance in saying, well, only certain political uh, organisations, so certain associations of different forms of political life can only work in certain contexts. Like you can't just pick up one form of government like liberal democracy and plop it down in another place and expect it to work because it doesn't suit the place and it doesn't suit the people. Mm. You perhaps can't invade Iraq and try and make it a beacon of liberal democracy. Yeah, and you can't uh, take over the entirety of France and try to treat it like uh, a democratic city-state. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I actually do... like it, It's not too much of a jump to get from Rousseau to totalitarianism. Like, I, I don't think that reading is completely nonsensical. Uh, there's a reason why every country on earth calls itself a democracy, even if they're not what we would recognise as being a democracy. Because Rousseau and other positive, positive freedom theorists recognise that people can be mistaken about what they actually want. And once you bring that idea into politics, um, although I'm, like, highly sympathetic to it, Unless that, unless that idea is constrained by something else, it, is a, it can become a very slippery slope because you can say there's a, a, there's a common good that is objective and it's out there and it's discoverable through reason, but individuals can be mistaken in their private judgment about what the common good is. Individuals can let their rationality be tarnished by their particular interests. 
And so if you take that argument just logically, you could have a democracy through voting where people are manipulated through the media, they're manipulated through commerce and luxury. Like he, ha- he, he talks quite a lot in the book about why he doesn't like luxury because it corrupts people, it corrupts their morals, makes them greedy, it takes them away from like public service. You can have a population voting, but voting in a way that's like corrupted according to your view of the world. And so you could say, well, actually, to be purely democratic, to actually express the general will and the common good, we need to act contrary to what the majority have said because the majority are mis- simply mistaken about what's actually the general will. And so, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, that's why you get, like, Rob Spear and, and the Jacobins and, 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 like, there's a whole school of thought that's, like, Lenin and, like, vanguard socialism just comes out of that as well. Yeah, I don't think it's a huge jump from these ideas to, like, various forms of, of, di- of dictatorship. Mm, but you can also... I think just as profitably read him as being uh, an illiberal Democrat Mm. because he says, well, whatever the general will prescribes, even if it, you know, violates the, the interest or violates the uh, freedom of particular individuals within that society. Well, you were wrong because the general will is correct. And if you weren't following the general will, well, that's your mistake. So, I feel like that can really be applied to somewhere like, I don't know, Hungary, mm. like Viktor Orban, where Viktor Orban smashes it in the elections. Like every, lots of people legitimately do vote for him. They really love Viktor Orban, but he's not a liberal. He doesn't protect individual rights and freedoms in the same sense that, I don't know, like a Western European or like an Australian or an American would view as being legitimate. But sort of on the I feel like on the terms of Rousseau's argument no that is legitimate as a form of government that's a that's a good that's a good point to make and I, I think it's like I, I say this to my students all the time that liberalism and democracy are two distinct concepts mm. and you make a lot of analytical errors when you roll them into one um, I mean that's why we call them liberal democracies they're two things rolled together democracy is about the source of power the power comes from the people Liberalism is about how that power is used and constrained. They're two different, one, they're about two different things. So yeah, I think yeah, viewing him as a liberal democrat, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's get uh, let's get some more detail on this idea of political legitimacy, because I feel like he had, makes some interesting points there, especially about power, like a, a certain society being usurped from outside or usurped from inside, like it gets invaded or there's some sort of coup of special interest in it. At that point, he says, like, if a society gets invaded and the people don't agree to view the new ruling government as an expression of the general will, well, to quote a common phrase here in Australia, sovereignty was never ceded. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, most of our listeners are actually American. Are they? Yeah, so maybe explain. Explain to our cousins from across the Pacific what that phrase is referring to. Right. So sovereignty is never ceded is referring to the idea that Indigenous Australian sovereignty over the land was never, well, ceded in a voluntary sense to uh, British settler colonial society and later to the federal Australian government. Mm. And because as a result of this, like this land was taken through conquest and you know, squatters and violence and whatnot. Uh, There was no agreement on the part of Indigenous Australians to give up this land. Well, sovereignty was never ceded. Thus, in a moral sense, the lands of Australia are still the property of Indigenous people. Not property is using a term that doesn't really fit onto the uh, Indigenous view of the world. They they wouldn't say that there is... Private property. Yeah, private property, but they are the custodians of the... Yeah. Particular lands on which they're, but I yeah. think I think it links back before to what you were saying about um, usurpers, mm. because I think the idea is here. And I, I apologize if I'm making a mistake. It's something I need to learn more about. But like, the Australian government claims to be representing and acting on behalf of Indigenous Australians mm. through a system that is individualistic and European, but the argument made is like, well, we never ceded our sovereignty. We never agreed to be 
folded into this system of government which now rules over this land, which is why a lot of Indigenous people today um, are advocating for a treaty. So, for example, like in, in, in the case of New Zealand, the British settlers were forced to sign a treaty uh, with the Maori, um, and as a result, like, they have much more... Like, there's, like, seats in the New Zealand Parliament reserved for, for Indigenous people there, which I think is quite cool. But that never happened in Australia. And so, yeah, the argument here is, like, well, sovereignty was never ceded. We didn't agree to be represented through this system of government that you guys have imposed on us. The Crown doesn't speak for Indigenous Australians. Um, so, yeah, like, you you were saying that that's, that idea is a nice expression of what Rousseau thought by the general will and how sovereignty can't be just usurped. Yeah, but... So, but I feel like that that point of the Maori really brings up a point of opposition to Rousseau that he he anticipates and then responds to, because in the example of the Maori in New Zealand, the British colonial society ended up agreeing to some sort of treaty with them uh, because there was organised violent resistance from the Maori, and for whatever confluence of historical and geographic and social factors the Maori were able to continue the fight to such an extent that the British agreed, yeah, we just have to peace out with you. Mm. We have to come to some sort of agreement because, well, for us and also for you, we're just going to mutually destroy each other if we keep this up. Whereas for a range of factors, that wasn't the case in Australia. So, Well, there was there was resistance. It just wasn't successful. Yeah, like the Australian government sort of rules via the kind of right of conquest, right? Mm-hmm. But he has a sort of response to this where he talks about the right of the strongest. No, I think that's, I think that's a good observation because as I said at the start, I think Rousseau is the best and the worst of liberalism. And why do I say it's the worst? Because you see a lot of the assumptions really made explicit. And so what, what you're talking about is like the fact that the Maori in New Zealand, and I'm sure by no means the situation is perfect, but it's better than it is for the Indigenous Australians is because they were able to mount a more successful resistance and, like, their rights came through power, right? So, but liberals talk about political rights as being these natural things, like they're just derived through reason and they're, like, they're a fact. They're they're just given to us by reason, devoid of social context, devoid of power relations. And... He says this quite explicitly in chapter three of book one, which is titled The Right of the Strongest. And he says, Force is a physical power. I do not see how its effects could produce morality. He is really rejecting this idea, which goes right back to like Plato's Republic, where Thrasymachus says, you know, the right is just whatever the strongest want. Um, he's saying, well, no, that, that's nonsensical. He's like, you're, you're confusing cause and effect. Um, Right, uh, our rights are like natural things determined by reason. Force, force is something completely separate. But I agree with you. Like, rights are social. Rights are relational. Um, we recognize each other's rights because we live in a society that kind of like our interests are sort of held at bay by the government and we're forced to recognise each other's rights. There's like, you can't, you can't be blind to power. And people who don't have rights in a society, um, it's because very often they don't have power, right? And, th- and that, that, that is the point that I think a lot of liberals miss. Right, yeah. And that, well, at least through Rousseau's own terms, physical power can't produce moral duty. And that also includes like the moral duty to recognize a particular authority. Like he he has this line, the duty of obedience is owed only to legitimate legitimate powers. And he gives this example, you don't have a moral duty to hand over your purse to an armed robber. That's true. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah. I feel like that goes at loggerheads with the whole power question. I don't, I'm not sure how to resolve it. Well, that example kind of begs the question though, because when you're being robbed, you're being robbed in a society. Right. So it's like the, there's like this social construct around you that's like that's the criminal, you're the victim, the per- the robber is violating the social contract, like all sure. these all these things make sense within a system, but he sort of thinks that like you can talk about them outside a system, mm. and yeah, it, he's a weird mix of 
he seems to think that his first principles are universal, but the things that grow out of those first principles aren't universal, which is why he later talks about why different places can't use the same political system. But the grounds on which he theorizes that he does suppose to be universal, which is, I, I don't know, it's, it's a very unsatisfying inconsistency to me. You know, this is what I really don't like about about Rousseau and about um, about libs, about the libs in general. Chapter 7 of Book 2, which I just feel like is a beautiful example of, like, the core of... of rationality that sits at the bottom of liberalism. Um, So he says, to discover the rules of society that are best suited to nations, there would need to exist a superior intelligence who could understand the passions of men without feeling any of them, who had no affinity with our nature, but knew it to the full, whose happiness was independent of ours, but who would nevertheless make our happiness his concern who would be content to wait in the fullness of time for a distant glory and to labor in one age to enjoy the fruits in another. Now, he says, obviously, this is not possible because that would be a god and we're not gods. But as as an ideal, you see that, like, liberalism posits that, like, politics ultimately uh, is a problem of rationality. It's a problem of imperfect information. We have political conflict because people are running around with bad ideas in their head about what's actually in their interest, what's actually in the interest of others. And if we can just have this perfectly rational system, this perfectly rational set of laws designed from the point of view of nowhere, it's it, 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 you read that and you think, huh, that kind of sounds like what Rawls tried to do in his original position. If we can just put ourselves in a position where we have no stakes in the matter, then we'll design this perfectly rational system if only we could do that, like that's the goal of liberalism to be to be perfectly rational. Um, and he talks about all the time, like the general will gets corrupted by our particular interests. And you see it today in contemporary Australian politics, like that appointments shouldn't be political, that like particular interests of like certain electorates like shouldn't interfere in like the national interest or the public good. It's like this very technocratic idea of politics that there is this abstract idea of the common good completely prescinded from like any particular context and we just need to try as hard as we can to act objectively and neutrally and and that's politically good but to me i i i kind of think that's like a form of anti-politics it's like well you have your interests and i have my interests and we need to get together and pretend that we're both not louis and alex where citizens one and two and we need to think about this abstract common good it's to me that's a form of anti-politics because it's not a it's not taking the 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 power relation seriously and b it's assuming that there is such a thing as this original position as rawls later called it which i just think is is a fallacy yeah like it's it's i feel like it's nonsensical to suppose that there's such thing as a perspective from nowhere with regard to anything to do with human affairs yeah Everyone is so deeply embedded into their own context that you can make attempts to recognize that you are in that context, but you can't ever fully step out of it, you know? No, absolutely not. And that's what I mean when I say, like, I think this is like the worst bit of liberalism. He really lays bare, like, so much of it is relying on this. And look, there's historical reasons for this. Like, it's coming out of the Enlightenment. You get sciences, natural sciences, and people go, oh, well, wouldn't that be fantastic if we could be as rational as we are about the natural world, discovering these laws? Can we do that for humans? Can we do that for society? Can we have a rational politics? Um, But I don't think we can. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. There's good and bad bits to, to Rousseau. There, there are parts where he really says some interesting nuanced stuff. Uh, he makes some really interesting predictions. Like there's this one part, which it's just kind of like an aside, and he's talking about the role of laws in a society. Um, and then he starts talking about Corsica, uh, which is an island in the Mediterranean between Italy and France and is ruled by France and he says Corsica is just like a really 
special, unique place, socially, politically, culturally. The valour and fidelity with which this brave people has recovered and defended its freedom entitle it to be taught by some wise man how to preserve that freedom. I have a presentiment that this little island will one day astonish Europe. And what, it, what happens a couple of decades later, uh, a young Corsican man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte <laughs> ends up uh, doing some interesting things. Rousseau anticipated Napoleon, <laughs> to use a term that intellectual historians would hate. But yeah, there's, there's just so much about this that's unsatisfying and so much about this that's also very interesting and insightful. I don't know how to make heads or tails of it. Yeah. Look, as a little bit of a tangent, um, I was listening recently to this debate on, do you know who Barry Weiss is? Heard the name. Yeah, she w- used to write for the New York Times and then she resigned um because she's kind of like oh the progressive left like they just silence free speech blah 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 uh, maybe maybe being a bit crude but like that's the gist that i get anyway she w- went and set up her own podcast called honestly um and i listened to an episode with patrick uh Deenan or Deneen, i don't know patrick Deenan. he wrote why liberalism failed right um and he's debating this other guy who also self-identifies as a conservative, but a conservative liberal, uh, whereas Patrick Deneen, like, thinks that everything that's gone wrong with Western society, particularly American society, is the fault of liberalism. Um, And he gives this reading about basically negative freedom, like liberals view freedom as being able to do whatever we want, which naturally slides into hedonism, and it, like, robs us of our capacity to make decisions. And, you know, it's kind of like this thing in education, like think critically about something, blah, 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 blah. Well, think critically about what? Like you need to be given the skills to think before you can think unconstrained, whereas liberalism just sort of tears down all these barriers and lets you go nuts. But like that doesn't really work in practice because we we need constraints to exercise our freedom. Um, so he gives this reading, which I'm like sympathetic to. And then the counter retort to that was, well, that's a very crude reading of liberalism because within the liberal tradition, you get all these thinkers who recognize that exact point. And historically, this is true that like laissez-faire liberals realized that to like, for example, maintain a market system, you needed a government that intervened. To maintain free speech, you needed like strong public morals that would stop people just saying obscene shit for the sake of it. Um, Mill was very much in favour of, like, censoring people, right? Um, He probably wouldn't have had a problem so much with cancel culture, maybe. So there's this whole tradition within liberalism that recognises that, like, yeah, you you can't just have this freedom carte blanche. Like, it's actually, it is a social construct. And Rousseau himself says this, which is one of the things I really liked about him. He goes, well... The greatest good, which ought to be the goal of every system of law, comes down to two main objects, freedom and equality. And if you've ever done a sort of like political philosophy 101, in Anglo-American political philosophy, freedom and equality are always portrayed as being like opposites. If you have more equality, then you lose your freedom and vice versa. But Rousseau says that um, freedom, because any individual dependence means that much strength withdrawn from the body of the state and equality because freedom cannot survive without it. You need equality to have freedom. He later says, where wealth is concerned, that no citizen shall be rich enough to buy another and none so poor as to be forced to sell himself. Kind of sounds like Marx's idea of wage slavery. And then there's a little footnote at the bottom. Um, He says, do you want coherence in the state? Then bring the two extremes as close together as possible. Have neither very rich men nor beggars. For these two estates, naturally inseparable, are equally fatal to the common good. And then he says, oh, this is the last bit I'll read out. Um, Such equality, we are told, is a shimmer of theory and could not exist in reality. But if abuse is inevitable, ought we not then at least to control it? Precisely because the force of circumstance tends always to destroy equality, the force of legislation ought always to tend to preserve it. So he recognises what people are recognising today, that if you just step back, the natural tendency is towards inequality. And he goes, yeah, so we need to step in and prevent that from happening. So I guess all this is to say that like my own thinking has kind of, I guess, 
developed a little bit and become a little bit more nuanced because of these critiques of liberalism that I was very partial to and am partial to, perhaps they're just crude readings of liberalism. You're ignoring a lot of like the own the nuance that exists within the tradition. Right, yeah. Mia culpa. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Marx read any Rousseau. Did he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah? Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Dude just sat in the fucking British Library all day reading books, right? Just chilling around, not paying the rent. <laughs> yeah, not paying the rent. It's the way to live. But there's th- that remind that just reminds me what you said there. Uh, that there's a part like right towards the end of this book. It is literally like the last chapter of the last part of the book, where he talks about faith and civic religion, and the, well, you need to have some sort of like civil religion in order to put everyone in the society on the same page, give them the same like a a common moral basis from which they make decisions. I've got a quote here. There is thus a profession of faith which is purely civil and of which it is the sovereign's function to determine their articles, not strictly as religious dogmas but as expressions of social conscience, without which it is impossible to be either a good citizen or a loyal subject. Without being able to oblige anyone to believe these articles, the sovereign can banish him from the state anyone who does not believe them. Banish him not for impiety, but as an antisocial being, as one unable sincerely to love law and justice, or to sacrifice, if need be, his life to his duty. And notwithstanding that last part where he says, uh, well, if you're not, not going to sacrifice your life to your duty, then uh, you, you kind of suck. That, I don't know, it, it feels like he's saying well, y- you need to have like some sort of ideological edifice for this stuff to work in the first place, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And look, I remember when I first read um, On Liberty by John Stuart Mill and in the introduction uh, by Alan Ryan, he talks about like Mill himself was incredibly worried um, that if you basically gave individuals too much freedom um, because Mill thought that like society was projected forward by the select few in humanity that were like the entrepreneur, I hate that word, but like entrepreneurs, the innovative thinkers, the critical thinkers, the iconoclasts, right? There's a bit better term than entrepreneurs. I really hate that word. The iconoclasts of society is like, that's what drives humanity forward. And so we need to have a liberal society so that these people can rise to the top and bring everyone along with us. But Mill was obviously a smart guy and he recognized that the reverse could just as easily happen that everyone could sink to the lowest common denominator and that society would collapse into this, like, its most base level. And without a hierarchy enforced about, no, this is a more valuable way to live than this way of life, we would just devolve to our lowest form. And similarly, Benjamin Constant, who's a French liberal, um, made a similar point. He, He very much worried that in modern liberal societies people would be too concerned with their own private interest and neglect the public good. And here you get Rousseau saying the same thing. He says, well, when you find people who care more about their own private self-interest, their private affairs than public service, then your state is pretty much over, like you're on your way to ruin. Um, And he says, like, well, when people don't care about voting anymore, you're in trouble, right? When people view government as just as a vehicle for various private interests... Like, your society is in big trouble. And I think in Australia and certainly around the world, like, that's increasingly the case in, like, Western democracies. And we're somewhat insulated from it because we have compulsory voting. But a lot of people just turn up apathetically and mm. just vote however. They don't really... they w- If they weren't forced to do it, they wouldn't do it. Um, and so what you're saying there, he, I think that chapter is called Civil Religion, yeah. right? He's sort of saying that for this system to work... Yeah, you, what, today we might call it an ideology. You, you need a public ideology. You need a, like a civic spirit for this whole system to work. People need to feel like they want to contribute to the public good, not just pursue their own self-interest. Right, yeah, and that has, that's the kind of like glue that holds the, the political society, the social contracts together. Because he says somewhere towards the start where he's going over his first principles that well, it, it doesn't even matter that, quote-unquote, the people, the construction of a people, they don't even have to be of the same like race or religion or background or anything. 
so long as they, in a broad sense, agree to the same ideas of what constitutes a society. So as long as you have this sort of edifice, this sort of like moral, cultural edifice that says these are good values, these are bad values, these are good ends, these are bad ends, as long as you have that common basis, then you have the means for perpetuating your, you know, yeah. your political society. But yeah, once that starts to evaporate and there are breakings within that between different lines, radically different lines of thought that are sort of irreconcilable, then your political society is broken too. And he, he talks about how easy it is to break the social contract. It's a very fragile thing. And that there are in a lot of countries in the world today that we would view as liberal democracies other states as well i'm thinking just america is an example i feel like rousseau would have a look at it and say yeah you, your social contract is dead your society isn't legitimate anymore it's yeah. too broken it's too scattered yeah pack up and start again mm. but that also just goes headfirst into the idea of power like i was reading this he talks about how like oh yeah the power that isn't recognized uh as being legitimate by people isn't legitimate you know legitimacy comes through recognition people agreeing that it's an expression of the not just recognition in the sense of recognizing that they have power over you but recognition in the, in the sense of that government that political society being an expression of the general will mm. which i feel like kills the argument for me like i just <laughs> i had this thought reading this where he's in like i don't know 13th century Eurasia somewhere yeah and he just his city just got conquered by like the Mongols and he goes up to like the Khan and he's like yeah you know you're not actually like a legitimate form of government <laughs> you, you have no political legitimacy because like I you're not an expression of the general will like no one in the city views you as a legitimate expression of government uh so you're just not real to me and then he just gets like dragged to death behind a horse <laughs> on the open step but I, yeah, look, like, where's the, where's your legitimacy now? Like, yeah. I think, I think in fairness to Rousseau, like what he would say is like, well, that person, um, is not violating any moral law if they, if they revolt, mm. right? Like if you and I were to just go out in the street and like set up our own independent Republic, right? Like we're violating the social contract. We're criminals, but if it's the government that violates the social contract and we start resisting the government, then we're not the ones who are breaking any sort of moral law. But you can see how all of this just like posits the idea of a moral law hmm. above and beyond the actual existing power relations. Yeah. So I don't know. And then, yeah. And also he says that moral laws are contextual to each society. Mm. So but he posits this weird mix of universals and particulars that just uh, maybe I need to reread it to you know, read some secondary literature to see if this is resolved. But uh, as I read it, it didn't resolve. Well, you like, you know, be aware of the mythology of coherence. Maybe, yeah. it, maybe it just doesn't resolve, but yeah, look, I, I, I think there's this, this, this fundamental tension within Western political theory and Western liberal theory. But on the one hand, you know, we want societies where people are free and people have rights. Um, but we also acknowledge that, like, for that to actually be sustainable in the long term, people need to view the common good as more important than their own private self-interest. And they need to have some sort of civic mindedness, some sort of concept of, like, public service or public duty. Because if we don't have that, then these systems will fall apart. But the ideology itself doesn't think that you can force people to do that. So I think it's very much an open question about like the whole Patrick Deneen take on why liberalism failed is that it's liberalism is just more and more exposing its inner workings and like this collapse of public morality, this collapse of civic virtue us viewing governments as corrupt and like, you know, operating in the interests of the, of the few, not the many, whether that's just inherent to liberalism. Because if you say that, I'm sympathetic to that. 
but a lot of liberals themselves preempt that possibility and are worried about it and say, well, no, we need to maintain a sense of public virtue, sense of civic virtue. We need to inculcate this like civil religion. But at the same time, they also don't give us the tools to do that because they have this idea of liberal neutrality and the government can't take a stand on one way of life is better than the other. So I don't know. It, it's it's a riddle. It's a riddle to be solved um, about how you actually prop up these societies. I think, look, republicanism, like small r republicanism, civic republicanism, as opposed to liberalism, um, is quite attractive to me. This is now an official Republican Party podcast. Welcome to the GOP. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of civic republicanism, we should really do Discourses on Libby by Machiavelli. Yes. Because that's, that's his civic republican virtue text. Absolutely. Not the, he, he is how power operates text. Is it? I also want to do Democracy in America. Yeah. Because de Tocqueville, like, he makes... Everything I just said, you know, is not original by any sense of the means. Like, Tocqueville said that about, it, about the USA. Mm. He's like, wow, like, this is incredible. People form these associations. But... He thought that like the long-term tendency might be for these sort of associations and this idea of the civic to collapse and that would be the undoing of the American experiment, which perhaps we're seeing. And similarly, like Michael Sandel, like big communitarian, um, in writing about communitarianism and idea of the common good, writes this book about, well, maybe the solution is this sort of like the, f the founding philosophy that America was founded on, which is republicanism a distinct form of, of liberal theory. Any final comments from your part? No, not really. Um, I think reading it and also events leading up to me reading it have really forced me to slightly moderate my criticisms of liberalism um, and also like acknowledging that there are these inherent contradictions and tensions within it and that's okay, like something doesn't have to be coherent as per, as Quinton Skinner reminds us in his famous essay. So look, yeah, I think I got a lot out of reading it, even though it wasn't the most enjoyable read that we've done so far on this podcast. Um, but yeah, we're going to be moving away from li the liberalism for a while. We're going to, next episode will be Confessions. Confessions by Usher. Indeed. Yeah. I'm quite looking forward to it. Uh, and then something very big after Confessions. Mein Kampf. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. We're going to be devoting the next few episodes of the podcast to Mein Kampf. No. Uh, our struggle will be reading The Critique of Pure Reason. <laughs> <laughs> the Critique of Pure Cheese. <laughs> Philosophy of mouse. Oh, what no. the fuck's going on now? <laughs> yeah, we're going to be doing uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, uh, slowly, slowly, book at a time. Um, not going to do the whole whole thing in one episode. That would just be a shit show. Yeah. Um, Kant is, feels like he's at the middle of a lot of stuff that comes after him, either you know, in a direct sense or an indirect sense. Yeah, he's the inflection point, I think. Yeah, so... The best way to take him on is to go straight through him. Yeah, we're just going to wrestle him head on. Although I do plan on reading, uh, in fact, uh, Deleuze's short, like, 100-page book, Kant's Critical Philosophy, mm -hmm. um, before I read The Critique of Pure Reason. Yeah, I was going to try to suss out an intro text as well. Just so I'm not going in completely blind. Yeah. But that is coming soon, folks. Uh, again, if you have any recommendations, if you have... Any requests for podcasts that you want us to do, please hit us up. We're happy to do them. More than happy to do them. Um, if you've made it this far in the podcast, you're still listening after I don't know how long this has been. You're an absolute legend. Um, please like, share, ideally share, share the podcast, rate the podcast so the algorithm blesses us and more people discover Ideas Matter. Please do it. Please, please, please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, folks. Peace. Bye-bye.